There we go. <laughs> so I'm going to talk, um, it sort of fits in with what Bob was saying, but it's a nurse-led qualitative study around clinical trials. So, and with teenagers and young adults, it's a slightly older age group from children and with slightly different needs, but I think Bob also um, highlighted some of those too. This study took place um, quite a few years ago now, probably 2010. Um, it was funded by the Bone Cancer Research Trust, and I suppose the most important thing is it was nurse-led and nurse-researched with um, a med medical oncologist there to help us with the bone cancer um, trial aspect. So why, why did we need to do this? Well, one of the big reasons is because there's few teenage and young adults participating in clinic bone cancer clinical trials, um, and that has been associated with less improvements in survival compared to children and to middle-aged adults and to other cancers. And as you probably know, particularly um, in this age group, five-year survival for bone cancers is still very low. So the importance of clinical trials and getting people to participate in clinical trials is really important. And although there's been quite a lot of work around increasing eligibility across children and adult trials in the, in the NCRI, Teenage Young Adult Clinical Studies Group, there still was no research looking at perceptions, experiences, why teenage and adults might not be participating in these trials. So we decided to look at this using qualitative research. And in adult cancer, they have found that understanding perceptions through qualitative research has improved recruitment to clinical trials. So the aims were to explore young people's and professionals' perceptions of participating in two bone cancer clinical trials. That was Ewa Ewing's and Uramus. Both of those have changed since 2010. And to gain an in-depth understanding of the issues, experience and perspectives and to identify strategies to improve and support participation in clinical trials for young people. So it's very much embedded in practice and in the practice of a principal treatment centre. So we use semi-structured narrative interviews with both TY, teenage and young adults and professionals, all within one centre. So it was a kind of an in-depth case study kind of approach within one area. Each interview it was lasted about 50 minutes and we analysed them interpretively. So each interview was analysed using memoing, coding, constant comparison, and we developed a framework for each of the group, the teenage, young adults, and the professionals, and then combined an analytic framework. So I'm going to just tell you a little bit about that after I've introduced participants. So there's 21 teenage, young adults participated, and that was out of 34 who are eligible. So we approached everybody within um, 18 months who had been eligible for the trials and invited them all to participate. So 21 out of 34 was pretty, pretty good between 15 and 25 years in age, 15 with, 14 with females, 7 male, 14 osteosarcoma and 7 Ewings. And 18 professionals were purposefully sampled, so they were invited to, be, to participate. And 10 were directly involved in recruitment. So there were consultants, registrars, research nurses, clinical nurse specialists, and 7 were involved in the care of the young people having their clinical trial treatment. So this is a big, it looks quite big here, but this is sort of an overall framework of the themes that came from the analytical framework. Um, and across the top is the critical points, which I'll talk about, but registration, then the intensive treatment between registration, and then the option to randomization. In the middle, the key aspect really is weighing up the benefit and burden around participation and then four influencing factors, communication, information, support and coping, the context of teenage young adult cancer care and perceptions around clinical trials. And I suppose it's also worth saying that the health professionals and the young people's, um, all their data and experiences actually very much reflected each other. And here I'm particularly talking about the young people's and the health professional data that supported what the young people the young people said. So registering on a clinical trial. And this happens around diagnosis. A few young people made an instant decision. So I can be part of a trial and make something, find a better way for people to be treated or an easier way to be treated. I don't mind being that guinea pig. 
Two out of the 21 decided straight away they didn't want to participate. They didn't want even to register on the trial. And for some reason, I just didn't agree with it. But most teenage young adults perceive registering as quite straightforward because standard treatment, would, they would all have the same treatment from registration to randomization. So we can make a decision to drop out, but we can't make a decision to, to drop in at a later date. But some teenage young adults find the found the timing difficult because it was all around diagnosis. So very much a sense of this is another decision I've got to make, you know, I don't really want to, I'm not interested. Why give someone this kind of decision when all this is going on already, you know? And interestingly, the nurses felt very much that the timing was difficult and that informed consent was difficult to be, to be sure of around this time whereas the medics particularly thought it was just straightforward at registration because obviously there was no decision really to make around changes in the treatment. So the treatment experience, you probably know from children's cancer, but with sarcoma the treatment is intensive and it's long. I was just retching, getting sick, I couldn't get out of bed, I was so ill. As a health professional said, you know, they're probably some of the hardest chemotherapy regimes I've ever worked with. That's in itself without adding extra 10 weeks or a couple of months to their treatment time. Some of them, okay, I've had enough. And that was a key aspect of both these trials, that they, the treatment arm of the randomization added weeks or months of treatment time. And for a teenager, young adult, I don't know if you look after teenagers or you've got teenagers, time, extra time is a crucial element. So they didn't want to waste any more time. They've, most of them had already spent or were going to spend a year out of their burgeoning lives of things they needed to do. And to have another three or four months of treatment, hospitalisation was just too much. And as someone said, if I was 50, then I probably would have done it, you know. Probably wouldn't bother to have that extra time. But for someone who's growing up so fast, life is too short. So randomization for both of the trials was a point of critical decision making. And for both of them, it was dependent on disease response. So the consultant would have a conversation with the young person at the same, about randomization at the same time that they would give them information about how their disease was responding to the treatment they already had. So it was a difficult time. It's a heavily charged meeting, everybody is anxious patient has a poor response, that's going to be a harder conversation to have. And although people felt it was, they were better informed at this stage to make a decision, they knew what treatment was, they knew um, what it might entail, people still found it very difficult to understand that it would be a randomised, computerised event. So I'll show you a little bit more, but the time and effort to make a decision whether to be randomised for a longer treatment and then in the end not getting the longer treatment when they were randomised was a huge disappointment to people. And you can understand it's that we're asking them to make a decision about something that might or might not happen depending on a button pressed on a computer and that's quite hard for people to understand. So seven out of the 19 were not eligible to be randomised and six out of the 12 who were eligible declined randomisation. So it just shows out of the 21 that we started off with only six were able to be randomised or wanted to be randomised into the clinical trial. And this is um, somebody's quote who just sort of explains that moment of having the randomisation conversation as well as the response the, to the previous treatment conversation. It was like you've had a poor histological response and like, what do you want to do? I couldn't make up my mind at that time because my head... In my head, I had four months more left of treatment. I was looking at this longer one. It was like double the time and more drugs as well. I was like, oh my God, I don't know. I stood outside by the lifts and I was just thinking like, oh my God, what am I going to do? So this process of weighing up is huge and, and does go on for weeks and time before the randomization conversation, but obviously that is the crunch point. I weighed up the pros and the cons, and I came to my decision. Obviously, you chop and you change your mind so many times, you have to weigh things up. And the two things really are the benefits. And the benefits is to helping yourself, giving perhaps an extra chance of survival, and helping others. I think one of the main things that drew me to it was the fact that when I was in this horrible situation, I could possibly help 
me but in the long run and also help others and I just hope there were benefits for everyone really so that was a big reason for wanting to be randomized and to be involved and it was actually a big reason um, for consultants and registrars in terms of trying to get people to think about being a trial was this the importance of clinical trials for rare cancers and without people participating there's not really much chance that we can get better treatments but the burden, as I've already suggested, was also the other end of the scales. Being stuck in hospital, I've talked about the intensity of treatment, the length of treatment. And again, this aspect of losing time in your life when you're a young person. Communication information, so the factors that were involved in helping people come to these decision-making points were communication and information. And we found that verbal communication was the most important and a team approach. So finding the right time, different members of the multidisciplinary team finding the right time, over time, so numbers of times needing to have the conversations about clinical trials and also the importance of having time. The CNS, and we're looking at doing some more research around this, the clinical nurse specialist was central to this neutrality, continuity, the relationship of trust, rapport, and hope. And the young person at the center, they didn't talk to me like I was a child, they spoke to me as if it was my decision, it's my life, it's up to me. And that was central to people feeling that they had trust, their rapport, respected, and were able to ask questions. I think for me, the knowledge was what gave me power and gave me confidence in making decisions. And if I didn't know something, I would ask. They encouraged my questioning. So continuing from this also is the support and coping. So support came from families, peers, professionals, and most often, as I said, the clinical nurse specialist. Some shared decision-making, but autonomy, again, perhaps different from children. I don't know, I'm not a, a pediatric nurse, but for teenagers and adults, the importance of being able to make the decisions themselves and nearly all of them wanted to make the decision. They wanted to protect their parents as well from making the wrong decision. They felt like it was their responsibility. It's my choice. This is someone who wasn't yet 16. It's not meant to be my choice, but it was my choice. And no matter what I choose, my parents would stick with me. And at the end of the day, you live and die by your own decisions, which is quite sad. Um, but then also peers. So, People talked about how they supported other peers making this decision about whether to be randomized, whether to allow themselves to have extra treatment. But somebody said retrospectively, if somebody was to tell me that things would have got better, so the treatment after randomization actually was less intense than the treatment they experienced before, if someone had told them that, they would have gone for it. But they hadn't been told that. They thought they were going to have to have another six months of that level of intensity, which for some meant being on ITU, having all sorts of other complications. So that's really important. And just really the context of care. So teenagers and professionals value being in a specialist centre. So this was a, a bone cancer centre and a teenage young adult cancer centre. So important for that, particularly for the professionals, was an embedded practice for clinical trials. It's not like that everywhere, I don't think, but where time, resources, infrastructure, and trials were valued, particularly the time needed to talk to people about trials. It's not a one conversation, I think, to make, help people make decisions. It's ongoing time and it's ongoing relationship building. Also embedded practice for teenage and young, young adult cancer care. And obviously a big aspect for specialist centres is about improving clinical trials um, and recruitment. That's one of the reasons why we have teenage and adult cancer centres. But team working, team support, communication skills, managing the individual and the family, the social, psychosocial multidisciplinary team aspects of teenage and adult cancer care were crucial to clinical trial recruitment. And obviously, knowing that you're being looked after by specialists in that cancer were also really important. And as one young person said, one of the reasons that I'm here today and one of the reasons that I can stand and sit and talk and stuff, and was able to get through the treatment and in this respect the clinical trial with the disposition that I had and the views that I had was because of the war, because I was surrounded by people of my own age I could talk to, I could help and they could help me, and that the nurses and the doctors knew how to talk to me and knew this and they knew that. So the conclusions really, in terms of what 
do we need to look at for improving um, teenage and adults, particularly with bone cancer, but across the board and their recruitment and participation in clinical trials? Is one, the importance of trial design, and that's been taken on board. Both those trials had designs where the randomised treatment arm was very different from standard treatment, and that has an impact on whether people are going to want to be randomised or not. Support from family peers and specialist professionals, particularly the clinical nurse specialist, and that's something we're looking at more, the role of clinical nurse specialists in supporting people to make decisions about trial participation, and particularly support at critical time points. And we hope that addressing these factors might increase acceptability, improve experience, participation, and obviously, particularly in bone cancers, hopefully improve outcomes. And that's just to thank everyone who participated in this. Thank you.